Good evening, and welcome to tonight's episode of Prince Hall Think Tank, which is a monthly show where we talk about various topics relating to Prince Hall Masonry. My name is Dave Gillam. I'm your host for the night. I'm a past master of the Mount Pisgah Lodge number 53, located in Columbus, Georgia, where Cornelius Wilson serves our worship master. And I also have the pleasure of serving as the worship grand historian for the most worship Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Georgia, where the Honorable Bruce A. James serves our most worship grand master. As always, the views and opinions that are expressed by us tonight in no way reflect the views and opinions of the, of the lodges and grand lodges in which we hold membership. Um, as also, you can uh, continue to post your questions on the Prince Hall Think Tank Facebook group or the live chat located on, on our uh, YouTube channel. Uh, so feel free to ask, ask your questions and we're gonna get to as many of them as we can as we have time. Uh, now, I'm gonna go ahead and pass it on to um, Brother James Morgan to introduce himself. And as you notice, it almost feels like 1995 when uh, Michael Jordan came back from retirement. And we have uh, Brother Ken Collins with us tonight. Uh, we we're not able to have Brother uh, Curtis Black um, with us tonight due to unforeseen circumstances. Um, but I'm pretty sure he'll be chiming in from time to time on the uh on the facebook group so now i'm going to go ahead and pass it on to brother james morgan good good evening everybody uh i'm so so happy to be here once again on the prince hall think tank uh, my name is james r morgan iii and i am uh, past master of corinthian lodge number 18 located here in the nation's capital washington dc it's always a pleasure to be here uh we we are very excited We've been doing a lot of traveling this summer, uh, and and uh, here in D.C., our most worshipful grandmaster, the Honorable Philip David, uh, he, uh, him and his uh, cabinet in the Grand Lodge, everybody's doing well. Uh, it's, I'm so excited to be here, y'all, and, and I just want to thank everybody, and we'll, we'll get to it later, but I just want to thank all of our Prince Hall Think Tank uh, fans and viewers and supporters, man. Uh, the past few weeks, I've been traveling quite a bit um, masonically. And everywhere I've gone, everywhere, I mean, I've, I've, I've been to West Virginia, New Jersey. I've been all over the place uh, the past month or so. And uh, hit, I'm touching down in Florida tomorrow, actually. Um, everywhere we go, uh, people are, are talking about the Prince Hall Think Tank, and it's because of you. And I want to thank you for that uh, first off. So uh, with that being said, let me pass it on to the man, the myth, the legend, the one and only Ken Collins. That's too funny. Um, hey, everybody, I'm Ken Collins. Uh, my service is direct worshipful grand historian for the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Alabama. Um, I definitely want to, um, as, as usual, um, give thanks to my grand master, who was Corey D. Hawkins, um, and my worshipful master, um, the Honorable Tim Sanford, a member of Pride of North Birmingham Lodge number 319. They're located in Birmingham, Alabama. Um, I apologize, I wasn't with you last week. Um, however, I've been under the weather for um, a couple weeks. Uh, um, things are coming around um, um, slowly but surely. Um, Dave and uh, James and uh, Brother Black have been holding everything down. And uh, we've been, like I said, we've been doing a lot of traveling. I've been traveling at least um, seven weeks out of the past five, uh, out of the past five weeks. So that's been uh, wearing down on me. And uh, Brother Black is using his 24-inch uh, gauge wisely. Um, and he'll be back with us. Um, uh, more than likely, this may be my last um, actual video uh, with the uh, Think Tank because um, I'm going to be moving on from the video component over to the uh, uh, document production side where we're going to be trying to roll these books out. Um, it's one thing when we have uh, a series of uh, five and six books that are one quarter written, three quarters written, um, a lot of projects going, but um, we got to put some stuff out and I want to make sure that we do that for the Prince Al Think Tank. And I want to say um, thank you, Brother uh, Morgan, uh, for the kind words, as well as you, Brother Gillard. No doubt. Yeah, thank you for that, Brother Collins. And as uh, Brother Collins stated, we, uh, we have several projects that we've been working on behind the scenes. So what you all see is the videos. What you what you don't see is the amount of uh, manuscripts that we put together. Um, we have several different books relating to several different topics that we're working on uh, as we speak, and um, and it's 
and sometimes we hit we hit a um, we hit a wall, then we move on to another book, and so Ken is stepping away to kind of alleviate that and focus on uh, getting those books out, and then myself, brother Morgan, and uh, brother Black can hold it down on these videos. So now I'm going to get into tonight's show. Um, this this show is the second uh, second part of the National Grand Lodge series. Um, this top, the National Grand Lodge has been a, been a much requested topic since we started the Prince Charles Think Tank. And um, previously, we did a show on clandestine masonry, and we were asked to talk about the the National Grand Lodge. But once we started to get into it, we saw that it was very complex. And being that it was so complex, we decided that we had to do was we had to break this show down into three parts. Um, so that's what we're about to get into now. The first portion we deal with more of the intro, what the National Grand Lodge was, what in what the purpose was, what it looked like, um, who was all involved into involved into it, and maybe some of the issues that came up with it. Uh, now we're going to focus on more of the middle section uh, from the Delaware Convention on up to the early 1900s. Um, so with that said, uh, we're going to turn over to um, Brother Collins. And as always, continue to post your questions, and we're going to get to those questions as we'll get 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 through as many as we can before, hopefully, before we move on to part three. And the part three um, is definitely going to be a show that you're not going to want to miss. So now I'm going to turn it over to Brother Collins for his presentation. All right, appreciate you, Brother Golan. Um, let me get things switched over here. Yeah. Okay, we good to go, um, everybody? Yeah, we got you. Okay, perfect. So we're, we're, we're talking about, uh, uh, well, my, my discussion is talking about um, what was happening in the South, namely um, Alabama, uh, for what's happening with the, um, the compact is up and running. Um, but the, the exodus of the independent Grand Lodges is also taking place simultaneously. So what we end up seeing is um, Missouri, Ohio, um, the brothers in Alabama, uh, Louisiana, uh, Delaware, those brothers are starting to break off and form their own Grand Lodges. So the, the first person we want to look at is Franklin D. Taylor, He's the, um, Alabama's first Grand Master of the Independent Grand Lodge in 1870. Now, Franklin Taylor is made, originally made a Mason with um, Simon Ash, who we talked about in the past, um, but also he's um, a very big name in um, Mobile, Alabama. He's a free black, he's living in Mobile, He's doing um, some exceptional things there. He's uh, one of the main um, uh, progressive voices for um, a lot of the blacks there in Mobile. He's a minister, but he's also held office there in Mobile pre-Civil War. So before the Civil War um, is there, he's ho actually holding office. He, is, as well as one of the other gentlemen who we talked about before by the name of Simon Ash, um, he's serving there. So they become Freemasons um, in the lodges in, um, in, excuse me, New Orleans under the Grand Lodge of Ohio. So the one lodge um, that they started in 1867 for in, in Mobile was actually called Olive Branch Lodge. And again, it was still under the Grand Lodge of Ohio. They, he only served for, they only had their lodge under the compact for one year, and the following year, it um, they ended up Ohio ends up leaving. But the remainder of the lodges under the Alabama, when they form um, in 1869, and when the Grand Lodges formed in 1870, that their their entire existence. That's why we say that the Independent Grand Lodge of Alabama has always been independent and not under the National Compact. But 
as growth happened with the independent grand launch over the course of four years, um, a lot of brothers were being made Masons out of the city of Selma, Alabama. So in Selma, Alabama, um, and people might wonder why is Selma so important? And they're like, why wasn't it Birmingham? Or why were all the lodges either in Mobile, Selma, or Huntsville versus being in Birmingham? They also have, what people have to remember is there was no Birmingham at that time. Birmingham came well after the Civil War and it started off as a mining community as well as logging community. So what we ended up seeing is because the train and the um, river system um, is the means of travel, but also um, a, a hotbed of commerce, we had Godfrey B. Taylor, um, Roderick B. Thomas, um, uh, Benjamin Sterling Turner, um, the U.S. Congressman, Jeremiah Harrelson, the U.S. Congressman as well, they're initiated into God, Godfrey B., B. Taylor Lodge number 35 out of the compact in Missouri. So um, a lot of the circuit riders for the um, AME Church are doing their circuits throughout the South, but we also saw the, as we said, the symbiotic relationship between the Grand Lodges or um, what we consider Prince Alfred Masonry in its earliest stages and the church, um, they, when they're going on their circuits, they're also making Masons. They're finding out the most influential men and they're making them. And what, what we end up seeing is 1874, um, the lodges are being made 18, as early as, I believe it's 1872, um, 72, 73 is when Godfrey B. Taylor Lodges um, actually comes into existence. And then um, 1874 comes around. I have the original um, handwritten per, uh, minute book for Evening Star Lodge. Evening Star Lodge was actually a lodge that was chartered by the Grand Lodge of Tennessee. For years, we were trying to find out, you know, what happened in Tennessee because a lot of the uh, proceedings are extant right now and we can't find them. And what we end up seeing this past year, we actually um, were able to come in um, contact with the proceedings of the Grand Lodge of Tennessee, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Tennessee on the compact side. And what we saw was a very curt message coming from the um, Grand Master of Alabama to the Grand Lodge of Tennessee, essentially saying, you've invaded our territory, you're making masons in Alabama, and you set up a lodge. This should never happen because we've been up and running. The Grand Master of Tennessee and the CCFC are put it back, and they have a, a nice little rebuttal saying that they knew nothing about it. What we end up finding out is the compact um, establishes a Grand Lodge, and they're the ones that established that lodge there in, um, in Huntsville. So between Huntsville, uh, one of the one of the major players in Alabama politics as well as educational system, other than um, Booker T. Washington, you end up seeing a man a man by the name of uh, William Hooper Council, um, the president of Alabama A and M University, which was also known as Alabama Normal Alabama Normal School. He was actually made a Mason in um, Montgomery, Alabama under the Independent Lodge. When the lodge in 1873, 1874 is established in Huntsville, Evening Star Lodge, he leaves um, after he was actually, I believe it was Grand Juder Wharton, and he actually becomes a member of the new Grand Lodge there. And the, the differences between the two Grand Lodges are um, the institutionalized um, persons and the free persons in Mobile are is what you consider the independent lodge. You have Simon Ash, you have um, fr um, Frank, Franklin B. Taylor, Franklin D. Taylor, excuse me, you have Eugene St. Gorons, you have a lot of the men who are movers and shakers. Um, a lot of them are actually the Creoles who are moving throughout the Midwest, moving throughout the South between um, Mobile and New Orleans, all the way up the, um, the Missouri River all the way going up into um, uh, Illinois, as well as in Ohio. So they're doing all of this rapid movement. 
Whereas on the opposite side, you have the men that ended up starting the Compact Grand Lodge in 1874. These men are um, the po political powerhouses. You have Godfrey B. Ta B. Godfrey B. Taylor, the um, the pastor of one of the uh, main churches there in Selma. You also have Rod uh, Roderick B. Thomas in Selma as well, who's the first black judge in the state of Alabama. You also have um, uh, Herschel V. Cashin, who, who's actually the first African-American to pass the bar exam in the state of Alabama. Then you also have um, uh, George Braxtall is the person that we're going to be looking at next, um, who's actually um, one of the first um, law enforcement, black law enforcement officers post um, uh, after the Civil War. So we're starting to see in the compact versus in the independent Grand Lodge, the, the differences in the people, they're movers and shakers in terms of business with the independent Grand Lodge. But when you start dealing with the church and those movers and shakers politically, all of those institutional people are actually in the compact Grand Lodge. And the question was uh, arose in 1876, 1877, that um, Alabama should try to reach out to the compact to try to solidify, um, excuse me, um, the independent Grand Lodge of Alabama, reach out to the compact Grand Lodge of Alabama to solidify masonry among, among what they call the Negro race and to bring them together to form one Grand Lodge. And what we end up seeing is in 1878, the Grand Lodges come together and the myth that, um, is, is spoken many times when they talk about when the Grand Lodges merged is the, in, in terms of Alabama, that is the fallacy that the two were equals. Um, and my contention, the two Grand Lodges were not equal. They were actually, um, they came together and formed, and the rationale behind me saying that they were not equal is the independent Grand Lodge was independent of any entity. The compact Grand Lodge was a subordinate body to a national body. Then if you move the conversation forward, when the two Grand Lodges um, came together and consolidated, the Grand Masters and all of the officers from the previous lo independent lodge retained their titles, but the individuals in the compact Grand Lodge did not, versus past Grand Master, past Grand Senior Ward, et cetera, et cetera. So when you look at that conversation and then what you end up seeing formed is the most worshipful sovereign Grand Lodge of Alabama, ancient free and accepted Masons. So you have one independent Grand Lodge who has always been independent and they move forward even though the membership, when they voted, um, the compact had more of the power um, in terms of um, the seats in the Grand Lodge, a lot of that was determined before the Grand Lodge session um, actually took place. There was a lot of maneuvering that we wanted to make. They wanted to make sure that the balance of power um, kind of held on. But the compact membership, given their political prowess, given their um, notoriety, so on and so forth, they ended up faring well in terms of the seats. However, in terms of the independent cause and the concept of independence for the Grand Lodge, the independents were the ones who are still um, going on. And the compact never doesn't come back until the late 18, um, 1890s when another um, Grand Lodge pops up and a gentleman is running around by the name of Begihi, just making people Masons. And um, he goes, and there are reports from all over um, and a lot of the newspaper where the gentleman was just going around and people were giving them money and he was giving them the password and telling them they were Masons. And that also falls in line with the John G. Jones um, lodges that were starting to be found in the early night, the turn of the century in the 1900s where they were trying to form up with the old compact lodges and to form new lodges as well. But what, we're, what we did see in Alabama was the, the growth of the independent Grand Lodge, but we also saw the rise of that um, compact Grand Lodge and the, and the political and social prowess that they 
that they had. And the two came together to found what we still have as the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn this back over to um, to Dave and James, and we'll get everything going for you. Thank you. All right. Appreciate that, uh, Brother Collins. Uh, Brother Morgan, were you on next? Well, I guess I am if I have to be. <laughs> uh, good evening, everybody, once again. Uh, your brother, Past Master James Morgan, coming to you from the nation's capital, Washington, D.C., where I have the pleasure of serving as Worshipful Associate Grand for the Prince Hall Grand Lodge here in the nation's capital. Uh, I'm going to jump on. We're going to bring on a quick slideshow for you all, and uh, we're going we're gonna to really get into uh, depth um, regarding some of the things that have that transpired that led to uh, the issues uh, with the National Grand Lodge um, uh, during the same time period uh, in which uh, Brother Collins was, was referencing. But we're going to look at it from a broader uh, perspective uh, and, and as well as a more specific perspective at the same time. And hopefully when, when I'm done, you'll see what I mean by this. Uh, what we're going to do is we're going to share our screen here. See that? Hello? No, we, we can't. Still, we, yeah, we still see you. We still see you. You, you still see me. Okay. Huh. Let me stop. My apologies, y'all. What about now? Uh, do you still see me or do you we see still, my... Uh, we still see you. Up. You're actually frozen right now. Frozen. Okay. Let's... Mm -hmm. As y'all, let's see, stop. Let me, try this. Let me try this one more time. What about now? Nothing. Okay. Last time was a charm, and if it doesn't work, we'll just have to go with it. Let's see. And we, I do apologize, y'all, but I want y'all to make, I want to make sure that y'all see, uh, see this if possible. No? No. No? Okay. Well, well, well we'll, just, we'll just abandon that ship. But but the presentation that I, I plan to do for you all this evening is entitled uh, The Great Lion of the West. Um, and uh, I wanted to, to just kind of highlight uh, the life, the uh, actions of uh, a man who's very important to understanding the issues related to the National Grand Lodge, particularly post-1878-79 time period. Uh, this man's name was, was Captain William Dominic Matthews. Uh, he is actually uh, featured on the flyer for this episode. Uh, so if you see, so if you, uh, hopefully you've seen the flyer, which is how you got, got on to our link. Uh, Captain Matthews is the gentleman with the uh, Masonic collars around his neck. Uh, uh, so yeah. In any case, uh, Captain William D. Matthews was uh, possibly one of the most um, important Masonic personalities of the 19th uh, century um, for various reasons. Um, he, he, he definitely ranks uh, very high up there in terms of his, his and, and as well as uh, his accomplishments were, were very unique. And, and uh, as I mentioned in the last episode, I recently published uh, some research on him, uh, which kind of Brought, brought me to a new, uh, not just new understanding of his life, although I don't necessarily agree with all of his actions. Uh, so I got to make sure I put that disclaimer out there also. Captain Matthews uh, was born in, in Maryland, uh, on the Eastern Shore of Maryland. Uh, by, by his own statements, he says he was born in the year 1828. Um, when he gets to be adult, what he does is he actually... Um, becomes a uh, seafaring young man for a while. He actually travels to Jamaica uh, for a couple of years, uh, returns back to the United States uh, after living there for a short time period in, uh, in, in the Caribbean, and uh, he eventually goes into business as a grain merchant, takes the degrees of Freemasonry in the city of Boston, um, and eventually, because of his um, political involvement uh, with the abolition movement, the Underground Railroad, uh, et cetera, uh, he eventually is um, convinced to travel to the western frontier, uh, to, to the town of Leavenworth, Kansas. 
um, there, and I'm giving you the brief, the brief Cliff Notes version. So make sure you go check the paper out. Um, but while he, when he, when he gets there, uh, he becomes very involved in the Underground Railroad scene there, even reverting to uh, violent means to help uh, escaping uh, persons escape from the uh, hells of, of, of chattel slavery. Uh, one of the things that he does that is important conversation is that he actually becomes the Grand Master of the Most Worshipful King Solomon Grand Kansas, which was uh, sort of a precursor to the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Kansas, which we know and love today. Now, William Matthews was um, just devoted to the, to the idea of the national uh, for a number of reasons, uh, I think. Uh, one being that he actually was a, um, a veteran of the, he actually uh, formed the uh, 70, well, what, what was originally the first Canada uh, Volunteer Regiment, which became the 79th United States Colored Troops. Uh, he survived bloodiest battles in the Western theater of the Civil War. And uh, I think this gave him a different perspective. Uh, not only of himself and his, his, his men, but also of black-white relations, but that's another story for another time. Um, in forming King Solomon Grand Lodge, Matthews uh, basically imbibes it with his spirit of devotion to the uh, national compact, this idea of having a national uh, organization for black men, run by black men, uh, that we controlled, I think was something that really appealed to him in a nose. Um, and so what, what he does is he actually, um, you know, does everything possible to ensure that the National Grand Lodge um, continues. And so what happens is that uh, in 18, are you, are you guys seeing the presentation now? By the way? Yes. Yes, we are. Good, good, good. good. Okay. Oh, so I figured it out. Sorry about that. So this is Captain Matthews, uh, just to, to, to get, get you caught up. And, I, and honestly, this is, I think this is a, a you know, this picture kind of says it all in terms of seriousness of, of this man. Uh, you see his tip. So, you know, he, this, this guy meant business. Okay. So, so we got it. We got it. We got the visual for you. Uh, now, in, by the late 1870s, as Brother Collins mentioned earlier, um, have this feeling among the different Grand Lodges, you know, many of whom had separated from the Lodge, many of whom had, const had continued to stay with it, starting with Ohio in 1868. So had the, Northeast, the, uh, the Eastern Alliance uh, group also that kind of predated Ohio's separation as well. Um, but by the 1870s, uh, the, the, the vast majority of those uh, of those brothers started to say, "Hey, we need to have a conversation. Let's try to let's try to figure something out." Um, and so, what they do, and I'm not going to step on Brother Gillam's toes, but what they eventually do is they decide, "Hey, let's have a, con a, a couple of conventions. Let's hash these things out." In um, uh, 1878 uh, convention, which was held in Delaware, uh, there was a series of resolutions that were passed that, uh, which I, I believe Brother Gillam will be getting into momentarily. These resolutions um, would in, would have um, dissolved, you know, closed the National Grand Lodge, caused all the Grand Lodges, you know, that were um, involved with it to become sovereign entities on, into themselves if they weren't already. And in states such as Kansas, where Matthews was compact and an independent Grand Lodge functioning, um, those two Grand Lodges would be. Uh, required to merge and form a new body, similar to what happened, or exactly what happened in Alabama in what year? 1878, right? So, so how all these things kind of uh, transpired through the years. Matthews and, and King Solomon Grand Lodge take a different stance, though. They, uh, while, while Matthews is there um, and, and he kind of hears it out and everything, that's not the direction that he wants to go in. Okay, and so what, what happens is that King Solomon Grand Lodge um, it, it was and remained a hold 
for the uh, National Grand Lodge or those who were who were uh, sympathetic to the cause of the National Compact, and that's uh, what what Matthews decided to do for the rest of his life. Uh, he was very dedicated to this concept of uh, uh, for for various. And this was much to the chagrin of the independent Grand Lodges. Uh, Matthews and his Grand Lodge uh, reject the 1878 resolutions for various reasons. Uh, one of the, one of which being they're basically saying, "Hey, we will not uh, fraternize with Masons who we who we have deemed to be expelled." who have uh, rebelled against the National Grand Lodge, which is an entity that we are loyal to. Uh, there's, they, get, they list a, num a number of other reasons, which, uh, which I will, will be discussing uh, in further detail in a future publication. Um, from, like, as I said earlier, from 1878 until his death, Matthews continued his Masonic organizing, and he didn't just continue it in Kansas. And this is where it starts to get a little hairy for him, um, as far as his former Masonic uh, allies and compatriots were concerned because what happens is Matthews along with another gentleman by the name of George W. Levere and if you, you know, is because we I believe we talked about him on the last episode but while Levere claims to be the National Grand Master he claims that mantle uh, in the late 1870s going into the 1880s um, Matthews when he when he uh, it becomes the what's now what's known as the most worshipful national following Levere's tenure in, uh, in 1887, um, Matthews is very, very effective at organizing. This is a man who, uh, to quote one Masonic scholar, was a leader of men, and we have to, um, we have to kind of give him that, right? Uh, he also was not afraid to travel. Again, remember, this is the, the he, he's a frontiersman living in the West at a time when the railroads are a new, new kind of, kind of uh, concept, right? And so Matthews, basically uh, towards the end of his life, spends a lot of his time crisscrossing the country trying to erect or resurrect or establish compact lodges and grand lodges. And again, this is where he gets kind of in trouble with the regular and recognized Masonic uh, authorities uh, that we know today as, as PHA uh, grand lodges. As the national grand master, again, he is not acknowledged as such by regular and recognized Masonic authority. However, he uh, claims the title. But Grand Master, probably one of his most um, famous, or probably he, his, his most famous act was issuing his uh, manifesto to Grand Lodges that had uh, left the National Grand Lodge. And I just want to read you a small piece of it, okay? Uh, he says here, uh, and whereas it have, having come to the knowledge of the National Grand Lodge, that some of the Grand Lodges and some of the above named states which are constituted by the authority and warrant of the most worshipful National Grand Lodge have in violation of their solemn obligation rebelled against the Constitution, edict and mandates, laws and regulations of the most worshipful National Grand Lodge. Behold, that all such Grand Lodges or Lodge and subordinate Lodges or Lodge of Mason or Masons who have refused to adhere to the Constitution, edict of the National Grand Lodge of North America and rebelled in open rebellion against their maternal Masonic government to which as the supreme condition of the constitution of existence, they owe duty and love. And behold, all Masonic and legitimate bond executive and judicial to enter and assume proper Masonic jurisdiction over all such state or states. Okay, this, is, this guy meant business, right? So I'm gonna take you guys off screen share. And so what you have uh, as he goes down further, furthermore to state in, in his manifesto essentially is that he demands that all of the former constituents, um, which includes many of our Grand Lodges in PHA today, um, he demands that they return to the National Grand Lodge or else. Now, what is the or else? The or else is that if they do not do it within the timeline that he specifies, that he will authorize the establishment of new Grand Lodges, new Grand Masters under his National Grand Lodge system or what becomes known as the Prince of Origin um, organization. And this is the, I'm sure that there was a last straw before this, but this was the final straw for Matthews regarding regular, or what we consider regular and recognized Masonic authority. 
And from then on, uh, that, that basically sealed the deal um, that there would be forever two different branches of um, Freemasonry, one which is considered regular and recognized, being Prince Hall, Prince Hall affiliation, um, and then the other Prince Hall origin, uh, which uh, follows after uh, Matthews and, and, and his, uh, uh, him and Levere's sense of governance, okay? Um, again, this is a part of our history. Uh, it's not necessarily a pretty part, uh, but um, the reason why I called the presentation the Great Lion of the West is because he was a dynamic uh, leader of men, a dynamic um, Masonic organizer. Um, to quote a report given by a brother named S.V.B. Cardi, where he describes uh, one of these um, National Grand Lodge meetings where they were kind of trying to get things together. And uh, Cardi calls him the Great Lion of the West, even though he goes on to say, well, this meeting wasn't appropriate, there weren't enough people there, there weren't enough delegates. Um, but he still refers to him as the Great Lion of the West, and, and, and I think in, in reference to uh, his great organizing capacity. Uh, my final uh, thought on this, and then I'll, I'll pass the mic, um, is that we have to remember, whether it's Matthews or uh, Roger Thomas or George Braxaw or any of these other individuals, a lot, most of these brothers, um, they knew each other. And so we have to remember that while we want to talk about the Masonic business that occurred and whatnot, we also have to remember that there was a lot of interpersonal relations, backstabbing, money. There were a lot of issues that, that compounded with the National Grand Lodge system, and we're just kind of getting and I would I would encourage everybody uh, within uh, uh, if you are a Prince Hall uh, uh, a brother or even a Prince Hall origin brother uh, uh, brother for that matter you know if, if you if you're involved in that organization I would encourage you to do your research on your actual lodge or grand lodge and find out how it, how how your uh, lodge how it, how it fell into the history of this of this dynamic story. So uh, with that being said, uh, I will pass the mic on to Thank you. Thank uh, Thank you for that, uh, Brother Morgan. Um, I will be, I was having some technical difficulties for a second. So what, what, I had to. Well, hopefully we haven't been hacked by Russians. <laughs> but I want to want to thank you for that, uh, Brother Morgan, uh, your presentation. Uh, also, uh, as, one, one thing I would like to put out um, with this with these episodes, we're not trying to sway anybody one way or the other. All we're doing is presenting information the way we see it and allowing you to come up to your own conclusions as to what happened with the National Grand Lodge and the organization call themselves Prince Hall Origin. Um, so now I'm gonna get into my presentation. All right, so everybody can see me okay? Everybody see my screen? Yes. You good to go? All right. Thank you for that. Um, I called this the beginning and the end part two. Um, in in a, in a last, in a previous show, my uh, presentation was called the beginning of the end. One thing that's been talked about regarding the eighteen the, le the legality of the eighteen seventy eight Delaware Convention was if it was a National Grand Lodge triennial, and it's been said that if it wasn't a triennial then it really had no power. So what we're gonna look at is the, the 1874 Constitution of the National Grand Lodge, just to see if that Delaware Convention could have been legal. And when it talks about um, uh, especially establishing a quorum, we look at Article 4 of the National Grand Lodge Constitution, which states the representatives of five Grand Lodges convened on due notice shall be indispensably necessary to open or trans transact business in the National Grand Lodge. So all they needed were five Grand Lodges present in order to transact business for the National Grand Lodge. It does not say per the National Grand Lodge Constitution that it had to be a triennial session. So 
as we know, there were more than more than uh, five Grand Lodges in attendance of the, uh, the 1878, 1878 Delaware Convention. So that convention was legal. Now, once we get to the Delaware Convention, there were a series of resolutions that were read by past Grand Master John H. DeVoe of Georgia. And these are the resolutions. My source is um, Accessible Archives. I'm using um, the Christian Recorder. Um, the Christian Recorder also has, I want to put this out there too, you have basically two sets of minutes from what I can see regarding the Delaware Convention. Um, they're not exactly word for word. Obviously, it's two different people writing it. So you're going to see variations between the two. But one thing that's kind of um, um, common between the two is article number eight or resolution number eight. It says these articles to be binding and, and a full force when two thirds of the Grand Lodges of the United States shall ratify the same. Said ratification to take place on or before December 31st, 1879. Basically, the, all, between the compact Grand Lodges and the independent Grand Lodges, these two thirds of the existing Grand Lodges had to ratify these resolutions in order for it to be effect. Um, and then it goes down to the 10th and it says, and the Grand Lodge under the National Grand Lodge and the independent Grand Lodges each solemnly pledge themselves to obey these articles, and we recommend that the National Grand Lodge do when these articles are approved by two thirds of the Grand Lodges, wind up his affairs, and adjourn, sign, die. So the end state was these two thirds of the compact, well, two thirds of the uh, Grand Lodges, compact and independent, had to ratify these resolutions in order for the National Grand Lodge to be dissolved. So after the Delaware Convention, you have all these comments. This was a huge thing because you have basically two sets of Masons, African, quote unquote, African American Masons in the country, and they're kind of putting heads against each other. So this caused this disharmony within the Brotherhood. So when we had this Masonic Union platform in Delaware in 1878, this was a huge thing. Everybody was rejoicing. Uh, I believe I include this on the last uh, show. Um, of course, I'm kind of partial to Georgia. So you hear, you, you see past Grandmaster Toomer saying is the biggest thing of the age. Toomer was one of the people that was present from Georgia at this 1878 Delaware Convention. Um, it goes into other people saying, uh, like uh, uh, Brother Jerome Jackson, he says, I could shout over it. These people were excited. We were finally about to have some resolution uh, and, we, and some brother and togetherness among African American Masons in this country. And one of the people that um, that also commented was George Lafere, who was the National Grand Master. Now it was also stated that because Lafere wasn't there, it wasn't legal. But you hear Lafere's own comments saying, "I I like it very much and feel certain of a success." And I'm sorry I did not arrive in time to take part in the convention. Lavere never said anything negative about this Delaware convention. William D. Matthews never said that this convention was not legal. Well, at least from what I can tell. If he may have said that at a later date, that's quite possible. But we know that in his, uh, I believe it was 1878 address, um, when he was addressing King Solomon Grand Lodge, he did not speak ill about this Delaware convention. He made sure, he, I believe he put in his recommendation for the Grand Lodge to not ratify these resolutions, which King Solomon Grand Lodge of Kansas did not ratify. So that also shows you the legality of this Delaware Convention because if it were not legal, he would not have even recommended what his Grand Lodge to either uh, ratify or not, not ratify these resolutions. So now we have people all over, even, even past National Grandmaster uh, R.H. Gleave says, without a doubt, it will unite our craft. What more could anyone ask? So these people were excited about this, these resolutions and how uh, they wanted everybody to ratify and we were going to have uh, finally have a brotherhood again. So my home state, this is a page uh, 143 of our 1878 Grand Lodge proceedings. Georgia ratifies 
the Delaware resolutions. And this becomes a big thing, and I'm, I'm gonna get into this later. Not only does Georgia ratify these 1878 Delaware resolutions, we also notify the National Grand Lodge that these resolutions have been ratified. Um, this is key because DeVoe was the one who read the resolution of the Delaware Convention. And the Grand Secretary at the time was Lewis Toomer, who was also present. And as uh, you can see, when it talks about um, uh, ratifying, they specifically says, uh, specifically state, and the abolishing of the National Compact. These people clearly knew exactly what was going to happen. It wasn't just we're going to ratify these resolutions and nothing else happens. They knew that they were ratifying to dissolve uh, or abolish the National Compact. The National Compact being the agreement that every Grand Lodge would adhere to the National Grand Lodge. So another state, Florida, in, a, in an article titled The First Gun, uh, Florida ratifies the Delaware, uh, Delaware resolutions. Uh, you have several states, Texas ratifies. I believe there was a Grand Lodge in Connecticut, off the top of my head, that ratifies. Everybody ratifies. And this is uh, from uh, Texas, where this report says that four-fifths of all Grand Lodges in the United States adopted or ratified the resolutions. So they went above and beyond with the two-thirds. They rat four-fifths all ratified these resolutions. So per those resolutions, the National Grand Lodge was supposed to wind up its affairs and sign die, uh, effect of December 31st, 1879. So per this report, per uh, other Grand Lodge that did ratify these resolutions, the National Grand Lodge would essentially have, um, have would been dissolved December 31st, 1879. George Levere, who was the National Grand Master, himself leaves. He now becomes part of the Independent Grand Lodge of Tennessee. But there were several things, and I apologize, this, this, uh, my presentation isn't complete. Um, so you have several things going on. You have Guggen's leaves, um, Lavere leaves. Everybody leaves except for Matthews. So Lavere leaves, he goes to the Independent Grand Lodge of Tennessee. He's on the committee regarding consolidation. Um, but Levere has several issues. He thinks he's going to become Grandmaster of Tennessee. Doesn't become Grandmaster of Tennessee. He's beefing with uh, Daniels. Um, and basically what ends up is Levere ends up getting suspended from his, from his lodge. Now Levere gets suspended. Um, what happens to him? Now if he's suspended, he can't be the National Grandmaster. And by him leaving... He um he basically forfeited his position anyway. The National Grand Lodge had essentially well, was dissolving. He saw that mergers were starting to happen in, in several states. He saw that people were ratifying, um, which the merger in several states were was part of the resolutions. So he saw all this happening, and he saw the writing on the wall. The National Grand Lodge was going to die, and things didn't quite work out for him in Tennessee. He ends up saying that. Um, he's basically going back to the compact, um, and he later issues um, a call to the 1880 triennial session. It's, this is part of uh, where I found this was in the Christian Recorder. Uh, there are also a set of minutes that do not call this 1880 session a triennial, they just call it a special session, which goes into the SVB Cardi report where he talks about there were not enough, uh, rep there were not enough representatives to even e even open the National Grand Lodge. Why weren't there any more uh, representatives? That's because everybody was starting to merge and adopt these resolutions. So Cardi says that basically they just opened up anyway. Now Cardi was a strong compact su compact supporter. So by him stating this, definitely leaves. Uh, lends credibility to his statement. He was for the compact, and he states that they just didn't have enough to open, which means according to the Constitution, 
they were in violation because they did not have five representatives to open and transact business from the National Grand Lodge. And this continues to happen for a period of 11, 12 years up until Matthews issues his manifesto. And he starts to reorganize compact Grand Lodges in several states. Um, now, what this is part of the aftermath and what I mentioned about Georgia. So if memory serves me correctly, William T. Boyd and John DeVoe actually had some type of altercation at the 1878 Delaware Convention. Boyd wasn't just your average person. This was a past Grand Master. He was a Grand CCFC. Um, he was very influential in the, in the Prince Hall, the quote unquote Prince Hall community. And when he started saying negative things about DeVoe and Georgia, everybody kind of followed suit. So, um, after uh, after a period of time, the the now Grand Lodge Georgia, the one that formed in 1870, which was formerly um, associated with the Compact or with the National Grand Lodge, starts to try to establish recognition. And when they try to establish recognition with Arkansas, J.C. Corbin basically tells them that, hey, we already have established recognition with the independent Grand Lodge of Georgia. We can't establish recognition with you all. Plus, we didn't see um, a public declaration of independence. We really haven't seen your proceedings. We kind of really don't know what you're doing. So why don't you all clear that up, what y'all got going on in Georgia, and then come back and talk to us. Um, so once this happens, and nothing that, 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 that is stated um, in this letter is he says that that he had received a letter from Brother W. Terry, chairman of the Committee on Foreign Correspondence of the Grand Island of Georgia, which was formerly under the compact. This is very important because it has been stated several times that Georgia was riding the fence. That since Georgia never made a public declaration of uh, independence, they were somehow still connected to the National Grand Lodge, which was at, it was just completely and absolutely false. See, for y'all not, Georgia had ratified the 1878 resolutions. They had notified the National Grand Lodge they had done so. Making a public declaration of independence was not a requirement. There is actually absolutely no communication from Georgia to the National Grand Lodge from uh, after 1878. There is nothing from the National Grand Lodge stating that they had received anything from Georgia. Um, they had done everything that they were supposed to do per those resolutions. The vote knew what his requirements were. He would have wanted to read them. Tumor who was the grand secretary, also knew exactly what Georgia was supposed to do because he was present as well, and they didn't bend. They did not, uh, they never made a public declaration of independence. They stuck by their guns. And eventually in 1888, once they merged with the independent Grand Lodge of Georgia, they started establishing recognition throughout the rest of the um, United States. And also on this letter that you see on the right, this is from past National Grand Master Richard Gleaves, where he states specifically, I consider the National Grand Lodge from Masonic power and influence dead. This was a, nat a past National Grand Master. He really had no reason to say anything negative about the National Grand Lodge, but he states here that the National Grand Lodge was in fact dead. So we see a period of years, and this is from, these are from the, this resolution was passed in 1894. Uh, so after the, um, the Matthews Manifesto, we see a reorganization of the national uh, of the compact by William Matthews. Um, but John G. Jones, who was the imperial potentate at the time, did not like the compact at all. He had he carried some serious strife in his heart against the National Grand Lodge. And you can see these resolutions being passed. Um, it said forbidding any noble of the mystic shrine or any temple to confer the mystic shrine degree upon any mason that is connected with the national compact or belongs to what is known as a national compact lodge. This was passed by the Imperial Council to prevent anybody from the compact receiving the, receiving the shrine degrees. And now we see after the reorganization, uh, Matthews used some unconventional means to reorganize some of these Grand Lodges. This is the case in the state of Georgia. Where Matthews comes in the state of Georgia, he, link, he links up with a guy named H.R. Uh, Allen. Um, Reverend Allen 
who, according to this article, was in sympathy with the compact, um, takes on the role or gets appointed as Grand Master of Georgia for the compact. And as you can see in this article, so the newly commissioned Grand Master began his work without a single lodge or member. There were no compact members in 1892, 18, or after 1878, there was no compact in Georgia. So now he reorganizes this with only one person, and he makes him the Grand Master. 1893, Smooth Ashley Grand Lodge forms, and now we have the reemergence, uh, quote unquote, reemergence of compact masonry in the state of Georgia. But as you can see from this article, there weren't three lodges that were chartered by some other Grand Lodge that later met in convention and formed the Grand Lodge. It was one person um, being appointed as Grand Master. Also, in addition to that, uh, around 1891, there were about 200 suspended and expelled masons running around the state of Georgia. These all the suspended and expelled masons um, get rounded up and now they form Smooth Ashler. And this is later explained by William Terry. I believe, I believe I showed this in the previous presentation where he states that these compacts were comprised, these compact lodges were comprised of suspended and expelled masons from my Grand Lodge. So this is what he was referring to. So then we go on um, to basically to present day where um, yeah, we basically go on to present day where we have um, our current PHO Grand Lodges. Um, I don't know how a lot of them were formed, uh, but I do know in, in the case of Georgia, they were formed without any lodges or members. So I can assume it, it may be the case in other states as well. So this kind of concludes my presentation. And I'm turning it back over to uh, Brother James Morgan to see if we have any questions. Well, thank you. Uh, excellent presentation, brother. Uh, excellent. You know, uh, one thing I think that can't be stressed enough about this topic is that there are a number of opinions um, regarding this. And, and, and as I think I said on the last episode, National Grand Lodge really was a horse of many colors, depending on where you sat. Um, something I was kind of thinking about uh, tonight, as, as I was watching you guys' presentations, is that you know uh, Ken talked about Alabama, and then we got Brother Gillarm coming on talking about Georgia, and I didn't mention anything about um, D.C.'s history with the National Grand Lodge, partially because here in here in Washington D.C. and uh, in, in our Grand Lodge, um, I mean, you start getting issues with the National with the Compact in the 1865 and little issues. Um, and then 68, we do have an issue where we where you had brothers who wanted to leave, but the Grand Lodge decided to stay and try to kind of work things out. Um, then in 1871, uh, our Grand Lodge uh, leaves the National Grand Lodge entirely, severs all ties. I believe the date was July the 31st, actually, uh, of 1871 when we did that. Um, our jurisdiction is very small, and, and brothers and sisters from D.C. kind of know that we kind of have a unique way of operating. And so when you're that small, probably the only other jurisdictions I can think of that, that, that can relate probably would be something like, like um, Delaware or, you know, some, some of those, where it's kind of easier to govern, so to speak. Uh, and so when we leave, you basically have a clean break. Um, you, we didn't have an issue of, of having, uh, having a merge with anybody or having splits and lodges breaking off or anything. We, we really didn't have that issue uh, as far, at least not as far as, as I know, and I've read most of the documentation uh, or, or that exists. Um, so, so I wanted to kind of throw that out there um, so that everybody kind of got a diff got that perspective also. Um, now, uh, now, I want to check here on our question this evening. Uh, we had, uh, you know, I wasn't going to say anything, but we had somebody come on here try to. Uh, try to take over the show on our chat room, but that's okay. I want to thank everybody for uh, all, all of our true fans for, for, for being, you know, the classy people that you are uh, and not letting that get to you. Um, the questions coming in, uh, can, bro, uh, Brother, brother uh, Collins, can you restate why, uh, why it was that you felt that the Compact Grand Lodges had more prominent 
uh, members or why they were able to attract more prominent personalities? Well, I'm not going to say they had more more prominent members. I'm saying the 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 amount of influence that they held the compact members um, it it somewhat overshadowed uh, the influence of the um, independent grand lodges. And I say this specifically because look at the positions that they're holding. You have state representatives, you have um, congressmen that are all members of the Compact Grand Lodge. You have uh, Jeremiah Harrelson, who's a member of Congress. You have um, Congressman Turner, both in Selma. You have Judge uh, Roderick B. Thomas, right there in Selma. And then you also have the um, Benford family, the Benford and the Henley family, family there in Huntsville, and um, he's appointed by um, Rutherford B. Hayes and Garfield, the, uh, the grandfather is. So they are politically connected. You also have William Hooper Council, who's, re who's receiving um, copious amounts of um, financial and financial support. You have George Braxtall, who's getting support from uh, the white community as well as the black community there, um, holding um, elected uh, positions as constable, as sheriff, et cetera. You have, um, who is it, uh, uh, Reuben Mims, who's a, w at that time, he was a postal carrier, but that was a, a basically a political appointment. So you have all these people in these political, um, politically active positions, and they're using that as ways, um, um, I'm not gonna say necessarily say to, to influence the Grand Lodge, but it gives it a little bit more credibility in terms of the organization. So you, when you see them in those strong roles, they're moving forward. In, in the contrast, um, where I see the, uh, what I consider the independent Grand Lodge, they are the money guys. Um, it's uh, Horace King making money. Uh, he's making money. You have Simon Ash making money. You have uh, John Ash. All these men own these co corporate um, entities. You have uh, Jeremiah Barnes in um, uh, Tuscaloosa. And what do they have? They have schools. So it's a different, they have the notoriety, the money, the know-how in terms of business. But on the other side, these people are socially um, sh social juggernauts uh, is the way I'd like to call it. But at the same time, the independent Grand Lodge had the money. The um, compact Grand Lodge, they had the social status, but they also had the numbers. Um, and, and, that's, and that's personally what I, um, that's, that's why I say what I do about the Grand Lodge, and the, the independents versus the uh, compact. Okay. And I'll plan on chi I'm chiming on that as well. I believe I stated on the last show, especially when the, in the case of Georgia, our, our uh, 1870 Grand Lodge, which was the one who had received a compact warrant, and our 1874, which was independent, there is no comparison between the two. The 1874 Grand Lodge, I believe we have maybe one or two uh, notable members. Uh, Joseph Robert Love, J.H. Um, Singstack. Maybe those two may be, may be it for the independent. I really can't tell you a whole lot about uh, A.S. Gordon. Uh, he was a past grandmaster other than uh, he served in the minister's union with Alexander Harris, which I'm going to talk about shortly. Um, but the 1870 Grand Lodge, that quote-unquote compact, we had James Sims, uh, W.E. Terry. Um, Lewis Toomer, John DeVoe, we had all the who's who in black America in that Grand Lodge. So from what I started seeing it, especially Henry Neil Turner, right, <laughs> Bishop Turner. And then when we have Horace King demits from Alabama into Georgia, uh, uh, Isham Cooper, who was basically a multi, almost a multi-millionaire during slavery here in Columbus. You have all these people that was part of this compact Grand Lodge. Dave I'm, not, Dave, I'm sorry. Can you repeat that last part? You said something about Columbus because you broke up really bad there. Oh, I said uh, Isham Cooper, who was almost a multi-millionaire during slavery. Um, he became the first Russian master of Bradwell Lodge in Columbus. 
So this, our 1870s Grand Lodge or the Compact Grand Lodge had all the influential members. So when I start looking at the power between the two, uh, it seems like may, maybe almost all over that the Compact Grand Lodges were more influential, had more powerful members than the independent Grand Lodges. Hmm. At least you know, in the early funny, stages. Right. But, you know, it's funny, um, you know, Dave, that you mentioned um, some of those prominent Georgia brothers. You know, I've been studying, uh, trying, to, trying to learn more about Georgia Freemasonry and different personalities and how they relate to Alabama, because a lot of folks know I, I research Alabama quite a bit for Masonry as well as my, uh, my, my, my personal family research. And, um, you know, it's funny that you mentioned uh, Bishop Henry Mignot Turner, because that is actually the topic of our month. Uh, I, I wish I had a little, the little, the little twinkle right in my teeth. Uh, this is actually a uh, book is called Bishop Henry McNeil Turner an African American Religion in the South by Dr. Stephen Ward Angel. Uh, you can get this book on Amazon. Uh, definitely, definitely uh, comes highly recommended by, at least by me anyway. Uh, I love how he, he's kind of got that lean, you know, I think we all know a past master or two that kind of gets that lean when, uh, when they're watching you guys do degree work and whatnot. So definitely check this book out. Uh, it's definitely one that you will not want to miss. I'm sorry, I just had to throw that in there real quick. Uh, 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 Brother Gilm, do you have any questions coming, coming from your side? Um, I haven't seen any questions. Another thing I want to touch on, when we talk about the resolutions, part of it was that in the states where there were two Grand Lodges, they had to merge. One thing that's unique about Georgia, and I, I, hate, I kind of hate doing this because I, I really hate talking about Georgia a lot, um, I know we got several other states and everybody want to hear about Texas, California, Washington, there, everything. But um, the case in Georgia was very unique during this time period because we saw in 1878 um, that, that they ratified the resolutions, but the merger didn't happen until 10 years later. Uh, the reason why it's, it's also been assumed that the reason why the merger took so long was because the 1870 Grand Lodge, the Compact Grand Lodge was riding the fence. That's why I never made public declaration of independence. Um, and they really wanted to see how this thing was gonna play out, which is another false accusation. The issue with Georgia really had to do with race and the church. And we all we talked about black men here and race was the issue. Um, when we go back to 1872, this is a book plug, The Negro in Savannah, you wanna learn about Georgia? Pick up this book. If you can find it, the Negro in Savannah. And what, and what we see happening is in 1872, Joseph Robert Love, who was friends with uh, John DeVoe, Louis Toomer, A.K. Desvigny, these were part of the higher social class African Americans in, in Savannah. They were all mulatto. Love was dark skinned. So the church they were attending started to change their rules. And part of that rules included excluding everybody who was dark skinned, which included love. So love states, and I'm going to post the excerpt from this book in the group so everybody can see it. Love is pissed. He's telling this basically, this ain't of God. You all saying you mean a God, but you kicking me out for being dark skinned. So now he, he gets kicked out of church. He starts his own church. And now these two churches are feeding with, with each other. 1874, the independent Grand Lodge of Georgia pops up with Love as Grand Master. These two sides did not like each other. Horace King admits in uh, roughly around 1870 from the independent Grand Lodge of Alabama. Notice I say he admits in, he was not healed, along with Reverend R.B. Bailey of the AME Church. There was no issues with those, with those, with those two. But now anybody coming from the independent Grand Lodge of Georgia had to be healed. This can be found in uh, some of Eureka Lodge's minutes. So these two sides truly hated each other. And I believe it was Sing Stack's son, uh, Robert Abbott, found, uh, the uh, founder of Chicago Defender, who tries to work for the Savannah Tribune. And he's not allowed to. The vote owns the Tribune. So the vote, I mean, uh, Abbott leaves, goes to Chicago, starts the Defender where he refused to hire anybody that was light-skinned. So this, this stuff that started in the church affected the Grand Lodge. And it wasn't until Alexander Harris, who was dark-skinned, oh, let me back up also, uh, th their network was so tight, and DeVoe states that they didn't have issues 
in Savannah between them, the mulattoes, and the whites, their issues was between them, the mulattoes, and the dark-skinned blacks. He states this word for word. So um, Lewis Toomer, who was part of that mulatto class, gets kicked out of the circle because he went to jail. He goes to jail. And because of this, he can't have his funeral at St. Stephen's where all the mulattoes and the whites are. He has his body is taken to St. Augustine where all the outcasts or the dark skinned people were. Um, then it wasn't until Alexander Harris, who was darker skinned, uh, pastor at First Bryan Baptist Church, once he becomes president of the Ministers Union with his secretary at Joseph Robert Love, if I remember correctly, then talks of merging start happening. It took somebody else that was dark skinned that wasn't part of that social class that DeVoe and Destiny uh, and, um, Tumor were part of to actually start this merge and get you understand about how Destiny's mentality was. He was part of the Blue Vein Society in Savannah. And to be part of the Blue Vein Society, your skin had to be light enough so they just had to see the blue in your veins. So these this, this lapse of merge didn't happen because of anything dealing with the compact. This was all about race and the church. But once they put in somebody that, like Alexander Harris, he was a war veteran, he was dark skinned, he was a minister, he starts to talk of brotherly love, then we then we see the merger happening in 1888. So um, I'm turning back to you, Brother Morgan. Okay. Uh, Brother Collins, do you, have, do you have any questions coming in? In, in, in your, uh, no, we didn't get any questions, but I, I just wanted to be sure that, that we that we made it known that, um, that there, there's no type of, you know, even in our presentations that there wouldn't be any type of um, animosity against uh, or harsh feelings about the Compact Grand Lodge there, even though we are um, an independent Grand Lodge now. But because you have to look at it through different lenses and through different times, um, there's a different time. It was what they had then, and it was, uh, and they tried to hold on to it. And, and and with anything that you consider important, you'll do, you'll kick, fight, scream, scratch, um, and, and scrape to make sure that that um, body lives on. And I think that's and that's what they were trying to do. Um, I think that the the move that they made to consolidate the Grand Lodges was the best thing for. Um, uh, Prince of Freemasonry, even the concept of the, the the compact, even though I don't think that they had the authority to initially do it, um, because they, you know, that's not what it was supposed to be. Um, it, it grew legs and and it, and it scattered. It scattered um, Prince of Freemasonry, but also it helped uh, plant seeds for the African American Church throughout um, um, across um, America. But again, there's no um, type of animosity towards uh, uh, the compact um, uh, of yesteryear. Um, it's more of a, it's a, it's a piece of who we were and who we are um, today as well. Um, um, but like I said, you know, this is a, this is a great topic that we touched on and it's a, it's something that we cannot um, let go um, of in terms of our conversation, um, a realistic conversations in terms of Prince of Freemasonry. Okay. Um, we did have a question. Uh, this is from Brother um, Reese Bird from the, um, from Germany. What's up, Brother Bird? Uh, do you see Prince Hall Grand Lodges forming a United Prince Hall Grand Lodge with one most versatile Grand Master? Um, I, I'd like to answer that. Heck no. Uh, <laughs> wait, 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 wait. No heck. Heck no. No, no, no. Not going to happen. But let me say this. Um, I do think that when they started to form the National Grand Lodge in the 1800s, I think that that's really what they should have done, to be honest with you. And I think that had they done that and been able to keep it organized, I think that we might even be a stronger organization today. I, I'll admit that you know, publicly, um, is that they didn't. And so one of the things that I've, I've um, kind of always kind of contested as I've learned more about this subject is that there was so much wiggle room in the National Grand Lodge. What I mean by wiggle room, from, I'm, I'm talking about from an administrative perspective. Um, while the National Grand Lodge, you know, said, hey, all these Grand Lodges are subordinate to us, and, you know, we run this and we run that, 
okay, but then at the same time, the Grand Lodges, I mean, truth be told, the, the Grand Lodges really didn't need the National Grand Lodge to function day to day. And as I've always said to people, all politics is local. And I, and I think that uh, uh, Brother Collins would agree with me on that, but you know, as, a, as a working as a political uh, consultant, uh, all politics is local. Um, taking the, the District of Columbia, for example, um, last year, and doing some research, we actually uncovered some of our Grand Lodge Minute books that we thought were lost forever. We actually found them, thank God. And as I was going through them, uh, I was actually looking for references to the National Compact. Now, to put it in context for you, D.C. had a very bad reputation for having uh, special Grand Lodge meetings like every every two weeks. They were meeting like, our, our Grand Lodge was meeting like a lodge, okay? Um, and I was kind of perplexed by the lack of references to the compact until, I can't remember the exact date, but there was a reference to um, the 1865 triennial session was coming, uh, DC was invited, but we owed some money in back taxes or assessments or something. And our grand master at the time, uh, uh, William H. Thomas, he was, he was ready to pay, just, yeah, just pay it. But then the membership starts saying something. They say, wait, who is this? Why are we giving them money? Why do we owe them? You know, it becomes this whole thing because they didn't feel the compact benefits, whatever they may have been, um, in their day-to-day -day lives, okay? So that's where I think the compact, as it was organized, really fell, got into trouble later because once the, once the state grand lodges realized, hey, we really don't need you and you're just kind of getting money out of our pockets. Um, you know, on the flip side, you know, you did have some restrictions in the compact constitution that, you know, put the Grand Lodges, you know, in a precarious situation. But ultimately, there, there was such, it, to me, it was an administrative mess, uh, you know, to be honest with you. And that's why when the Grand Lodges left, I mean, Matthews, as National Grand Master, says, hey, you guys better come back. But he really didn't have any power to do anything. I mean, whether you agree that Levere and Matthews, what they were doing was legal or not, they really didn't have any power to enforce anything on the Grand Lodges in, a, in a, any real practical way. So, just something to consider. But to answer the question, no, not gonna happen. I see we got a question in from my brother on the YouTube uh, uh, chat uh, who asked um, about, specifically about the most worshipful Finger Grand Lodge uh, of Mississippi. And for those who do not know, um, our brothers in the great state of Mississippi do not use the term or the, the name of Prince, the Prince Hall Grand Lodge uh, for their own reasons. They go by the most worshipful Stringer Grand Lodge uh, of Mississippi. Uh, I believe Stringer was a member of the compact. I don't know all the details behind that um, in terms of how they joined and left. I'm trying to find it, uh, a reference to it very quickly. But, Stringer, but, Str mm -hmm. Stringer was a, a member of the... Uh of the compact, he was actually under um, the Grand Lodge of Ohio, and then also um, Louisiana. He's, I think, he's one of the few who served as a Grand Master of multiple jurisdictions. Um, um, he's the old, he's the old guard. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think I have a picture of him um, over here. And and the 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 notoriety and the uh, respect that Stringer brought with um, Prince Hall Freemasonry, it's, it was no joke. He was, a, he was a powerful man. And what he exuded was not only with um, uh, fraternal life, but life itself in, 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 social, in social circles. Stringer was uh, unlike any of the other Grand Masters. He's that, he's that powerful, they said it was a boom, booming voice. And um, let me try to screen share this for you. And um, yes, this is the old man. They call him the old man. And Stringer himself was also the, um, the essentially the father of the Knights of Pythians, as well as other uh, fraternal um, organizations as well um, among African Americans um, throughout the um, rural South. But, you know, he's one of the people that you can't overlook Stringer Grand Lodge, how it started off as a, um, a compact Grand Lodge. Uh, uh, but also, uh, they, they, as a matter of fact, uh, talking to their Grand Master, uh, they have the actual charter for the Grand Lodge. And 
the Grand Master actually has it on his wall and he he laughs about it when uh, you have a conversation with him and they know that they are an independent Grand Lodge, but it's just a, one of those heirlooms that you just don't um, ever let, uh, let go. Yeah, it's an artifact, yeah. Um, I, I found a reference here um, uh, in the, the uh, National Grand Lodge Prince Hall Masonry by Alton Roundtree, where he states that uh, Stringer Grand Lodge uh, was compact in 1875 when it formed, and then um, they declared independence in 1883. Uh, so, so to answer the brother's question, but thank you for that, brother Collins. One thing I'm, I mentioned about those um, those charters. Uh, going back to my home state, uh, the great state, the Garden State of New Jersey, where we don't have to pump our own gas. Um, actually, uh, recently we're, we're we're reading the um, footprints of Prince Hall Street in the state of New Jersey by past Grandmaster Aldrich, and um, in there he actually makes a reference to the fact that you had an, a compact grand. Then right after that, you have an independent Grand Lodge, 1850, and those two Grand Lodges basically were at war with each other for 25 years. 1875, they come together, and uh, when, they, when they unite and form the United Grand Lodge of the state of New Jersey, um, a, the, they actually had a burning ceremony of the charters of the two because they didn't want them to fall into uh, the hands of you know, someone trying to go off and start some clandestine body or something like that. And they did it in public in front of, you know, in front of the entire Grand Lodge membership, uh, which I thought was kind of a funny uh, reference. So I was telling, I was telling their new, their new Grand Master about that a few weeks ago. So, yeah. Okay, go on. Uh, we, we don't have a question. We have basically another statement. Um, and he said he sees that he sees other, other Grand Lodges doing it or basically other areas doing it as we speak. And it's legit. And there are no problems. So trying to figure, I guess, about the National Grand Lodge. Do, do what? Thing, uh, basically, have have any National Grand Lodge. One thing that's assumed is a comparison I've seen made is that the current group called Prince Hall Origin operates the same way as the United Grand Lodge of England, which is false. They do not operate the same way as the Grand Lodge of England. The, the Grand Lodge, United Grand Lodge of England, has provincial Grand Lodges. Those provincial Grand Lodges equate to the same thing as a district. If you ask a member of that provincial Grand Lodge who is his Grand Master, he is going to tell you the Grand Master United Grand Lodge of England. If you ask, um, let's see, I can't think of anybody else at the top, off the top of my head. If you ask somebody from Prince Hall Origin, let's, let's say in the state of Georgia, who is your Grand Master? They're going to say Lester Clark because he's the Grand Master of Smooth Ashler. And then they have a National Grand Master. So, no, it is not the exact same thing. Um, in order for it to be the same thing, those these uh, PHO Grand Lodges would have to become districts or uh, something, and then their Grand Master would be the National Grand Master, not the one for that particular state. So, yeah, it is not between the current group PHO and the United Grand Lodge of England, it's not the same thing. Right. Uh, and I believe that's it, um, Brother Morgan. Oh, well. As always, it's a pleasure to be here uh, on the Prince Hall Think Tank. Uh, I do want to make sure I do a, a few quick, uh, very quick plugs. Uh, first of all, let me just say uh, this was directed to one of our former uh, guests, or not only say former, but a previous guest of the show uh, who is now styled and titled Most Worshipful Past Grand Master Shelton J. Prescott of the state of New Jersey, my home state. Uh, I want to congratulate him on, on a successful conclusion of his tenure in the Grand East. And I especially want to thank him. Uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I journeyed to uh, New Jersey's Grand Session. Uh, got to see many of our Prince Hall Think Tank fans. Everybody was loving it. And uh, Grandmaster Prescott was gracious enough to um, bless me with an honorary membership in the most worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of the state of New Jersey. And I just can't thank him in the state of New Jersey enough for that. Uh, as I said then, and I'll say it now, although I became a Mason in D.C., uh, the man you see before uh, was born and reared in the great state of New Jersey, Essex County in particular. And uh, it meant the world to me to have my, um, the Grand Lodge of my home state to recognize uh, my Masonic work. And, and I hope that I continue to make uh, New Jersey proud. Um, so I can't thank him enough for that. Uh, I also want to make sure that I give a shout out to the brothers of the Most Worshipful Prince Hall Grand Lodge of West Virginia. 
I also went up there um, with, with our deputy grandmaster, uh, right where from Quincy Gant a few weeks ago. And, uh, we went up there and had a, and had a wonderful time. Uh, you know, I, it's funny. I had a bunch of brothers say that Prince Hall Grand Lodge in West Virginia. Yes, there is a Prince Hall Grand Lodge in West Virginia, and those brothers are doing excellent work. Uh, and I want to want to thank them. Uh, for 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 the warm welcome. As soon as I, I was getting ready to go to lunch, and somebody just walked up to me and handed me up a, a package of historical material and said, "Hey, you know, when's West Virginia going to be on the Prince Hall Think Tank?" So now that so now that we got the material, now we got some 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 brothers up there that we know that we can reach out to. Maybe we'll get a, get a, get an episode on West Virginia to see how they're doing it up there. And I want to thank them for that also. And last but not least, I just want to I just want to thank all of our fans, man. Everybody who's been viewing it, uh, viewing the show uh, every night. And, you know, I, I sit I sit back and I go, man, are we really making an impact? Past Saturday, I meet brothers from Jerusalem Lodge uh, down in um in, in P- Petersburg. Uh, I meet brothers from Herbert E. Miller Lodge up in Pennsylvania, and they're walking up to me. They're saying, y- "Your brother Morgan." I'm like, "Well, yeah, hi." You know, but but it just it's just these past few weeks have been so wonderful, and I want to thank all of you guys uh, from the bottom of my heart. Uh, and I, and I have a bet going because I'm I'm gonna be uh, but I'm gonna be in Florida. Uh, for the next few days, and I have a bet on right now with my significant other that I'm going to run into somebody who watches the Prince Hall Think Tank. I'm not going to tell y'all where. Y'all will find out after, but I'm going to be somewhere in Florida over the next few days, and I'm willing to bet that we'll that that's how deep Prince Hall Think Tank goes. I will find a Prince Hall Think Tank fan somewhere in the Sunshine State. But with that, I'm signing off, and I will see you all next time. Dave? Okay, thank you for that, uh, Brother Morgan. Um, this one, as Brother Morgan stated, I think I want to thank you all for your support. Um, it really means a lot when you all hit us up and uh, make suggestions, comments, questions, anything about the Prince Hall Fame Tank. We truly appreciate it. Uh, I believe I gave a shout out on a previous episode, but thanks to the brothers of the Prince Hall Garage in Nebraska. They really showed me a lot of love when I was out there. Uh, next, I'll be in... Um, in the area of the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of California on tomorrow, and then follow that up by the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Minnesota. And, um, and I definitely be reaching out to past Grandmaster Kenfis Muhammad as soon as I touch down in Minnesota. Um, and I'll be pretty much all over the country for the rest of the year. Um, so thank you all for your support. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, and I know for the ones that like a lot, a lot of the past material or the episodes that we had, uh, we're gonna get back into that. We just had to get this National Grand Lodge uh, series out the way. Um, I can't speak for the rest of the panelists, but personally, once this is done, I never wanna talk about this ever again. Um, and uh, one of the things that we've been kicking around, and I believe we may do it between September and October, is half a member from the Prince Hall Grand Lodge of Liberia on this show, we're gonna talk about masonry in Liberia, um, or Prince Hall masonry in Liberia. So we're gonna get into that. Um, we still have some couple ideas with crossover episodes with the Masonic Roundtable and uh, and Phoenix Masonry. So you're gonna see a lot more diversity with the Prince Hall think tank. Um, I know some people get tired, like, why are we all talking about clandestine masonry? Uh, we're gonna get back to what we're doing and educate as soon as we get through this series. Uh, I wanna thank you, part three, uh, we're still working on tentatively, tentatively, um, fingers crossed, we're looking at having uh, the author of Untold Truth, Alton Roundtree, on the next episode, as well as the author of Landmarks of Our Father, John Harrison. Uh, we will still see how that's going to go, that episode, because we have a lot of moving pieces. Um, I know Brother Roundtree has a lot of things going on. I believe he's writing another book or doing. He's always doing something. And uh, Brother Harrison is, is working something. on his. Piece. Let me tell you something. Dave. As someone who's known Brother Roundtree all his, all of my Masonic life, he's always writing another book. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So we gotta we gotta figure out when everybody's schedule can match up, and then hopefully we'll bring part three to you, which will be the the, um, the final episode of this series. Um. A couple, of, a couple other things that we've talked about. Oh, we're gonna have um, uh, our shrine episode this month. It's gonna be the first time we we have, we actually address anything about the shrine. Um, so uh, be on the lookout for that flyer coming soon. 
And now I'm going to turn over to Brother Collins. But as always, always, cheer for the New York Knicks and the St. Louis Cardinals. You know what? I'm, I'm not even. <laughs> I, 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 this is like the worst. Like when we have, we have, thank you. Will James, as usual, Alabama has to clean everything up. We want to thank Brother Antonio Caffey for coming up with such a, a pro, prolific group. And well, know, this has been a lot of fun um, with everybody. We really uh, had a lot of fun with this. And we don't ever want to talk about it. Uh, after we finish this series, we don't ever want to talk about it ever again because it's something that we're extremely tired of. But um, you know, this it's been it's been great. Uh, the, the 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 love that we've been getting from people is um, being ongoing, and things are still moving forward um, in terms of um, Masonic education. And we're starting to see brothers from all um, all over the country are are interested generally in not only history but actually um, the uh, tenets of Freemasonry and the questions that come in. No question is too dumb. Um, however, people do not read threads. Uh, so that's some of the things that we, we're, we are noticing that brothers are starting to pick up books more. They're starting to talk about it and um, they're getting through to that, edif uh, that edu edu edification stage and we're, we're actually starting to get and grasp everything. Again, we want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, we love the um, Think Tank um, supporters. You guys have been um, have been great. And no matter where we're at, if I'm in Indiana, uh, Detroit, people are saying, hey, you guys are with the Think Tank. But again, we want to um, thank everybody. One last thing um, before I go, um, congratulations to Brother Gil Arms, um, who has recently had uh, a child just get out of uh, uh, high school. Um, so congratulations to um, um, young sister Gil Arm. And I have to send a shout out to my uh, big girl, um, Loren, who's at um, Georgia um, Military uh, Institute, as well as a high school student. So giving a shout out to her and uh, keep, up, keep up the good work. Um, as usual with the Prince All Think Tank, we want to thank everybody for tuning in. Um, if you get a book, pick it up and actually read it. And after you get done, pass it along to somebody else. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I, I, I don't have no kids, so I can't shout out my children. <laughs> Hey. I just want to throw that out there, but I do want to I do want to answer one question. We just got a question in last minute. Someone asked about Charles Wesley's uh, history, Prince Hall Life and Legacy. I'm sure we'll talk about it in another episode. I think we probably have already, but but it's a good book. But we'll probably check check talk about that in another episode. I just want to make sure I acknowledge the person who asked that question. Uh, so yeah. All right, I really don't have anything else. Uh, also, no, also be on the lookout. We're gonna have a look at having an episode with Brother Tristan Borland, the director of the movie Terra Masonica. Uh, we're looking at have him on the show. Um, if you pop, you probably seen the links in the group about uh, Terra Masonica. I believe you can purchase on purchase it on Am Amazon and iTunes. Um, I tell you, I had a great time shooting the movie, and I believe we have so much footage that we could shoot a Georgia movie uh, on its own. So it is, it, it it was a great time with this movie. But anyway, uh, thank you for tuning into the uh, Prince Hall Think Tank. And we look forward to seeing you in the next episode. Good night. Peace. Good night, everybody. <laughs>